April 20th, 1999, Littleton, Colorado, Columbine High School. Two students walked into the school with multiple weapons and dozens of homemade explosives. In less than 20 minutes, they killed 12 students, one teacher, and wounded 21 others. Prior to Columbine, no one knew what the term active shooter meant. When this event took place, the normal police procedure was to set up a perimeter and wait for special response teams to arrive. This proved to be a completely ineffective tactic in an active killer event. Now, nationwide, the standard of training is that a single officer may now provide tactical intervention to protect lives. They respond to the sound of stimulus, which may be the sound of gunfire or screaming or people fleeing. Their priorities in this order, stop the assailant, rescue victims, provide medical assistance. When there's no longer signs that there is ongoing killing, officers will begin extraction team protocols. They will locate victims, provide first aid of combat casualty care, then remove victims to a casualty collection point. They have two priorities, stop the killing, stop the dying. Officers in the building now start to provide patient care. They assess casualties using MARCH. Massive hemorrhage, airway, respiration, circulation, and head injury. Triage tags will not be used in a warm zone. They will be used at the casualty collection point. If they have a cat tourniquet or a chest seal, they are immediate. August 2018. NFPA 3000, Standard for Active Shooter Hostile Event, also known as ASHER, was adopted nationwide, which now added the fire and EMS component into the ASHER event. No longer do crews wait outside for the all clear, but move into the warm zone wearing ballistic protection equipment with armed officers providing force protection. They now enter to quickly triage and to stop the bleed. The scenario you are about to see is a fire EMS based rescue task force. National statistics show that immediate life saving interventions from law enforcement officers prior to fire based rescue task force teams have been most effective in these events. From the year 2010 to 2018, there has been a steady increase in the amount of school shootings annually. During these events, Every time you hear a gunshot, another child or teacher is possibly killed or wounded. to arrive will be the contact team and will search for the killer. Once fire and EMS arrive, they will link up with police officers and enter the building as a rescue task force team. The police officers will provide force protection for the team. They will be operating in the warm zone, which is the area that is behind the contact team, which is operating in the hot zone. Law enforcement officers will control the hallways and the rooms, providing cover so that the rescue task force members may quickly assess the casualties' injuries, place tourniquets, chest seals, apply clotting agents, or trauma dressings to those that are in need. Depending on when and where the killer started, Multiple rescue task force teams may be operating in separate areas within the warm zone. The incident may be in one room or across an entire campus.
It's okay. Keep breathing, Sophie. It's okay. Just five. Five. Oh, five. Go. Okay. All right. Here we go. Good luck. I got you. We're upgrading them. Come on. All right. While rescue task force is treating patients, the next teams in will be extraction teams. The officers that provide force protection can also help with the extraction of as many victims as possible. As soon as all life-saving measures are complete, Rescue Task Force members, firefighters, and law enforcement will become an extraction team. They will move as many victims as they can to the casualty collection point. Extraction team members will remove victims by any means possible. They can use soft litters, sheets, or hand carry as many victims as they need to to get them to the casualty collection point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Law enforcement officers will create an evacuation corridor, a secure pathway for accessing and removing all casualties. The officers will provide force protection for the litter bearer teams through the warm zone to the casualty collection point. Once patients reach the casualty collection point, triage begins. For pediatrics, we use jump start, RPM. We assess respirations, perfusion, mental status. Triage bands will now be assigned. Green for walking wounded, yellow for delayed, red for immediate, and black for deceased. Vehicle access will most likely be extremely limited due to the overwhelming number of police vehicles that have arrived on scene. Most likely three sides of the building will not be accessible by EMS. Combat applied tourniquets, chest seals, clotting agents, trauma dressings, and soft litters are the most important tools for rescue task force and extraction teams during these operations. In the casualty collection point, while crews are waiting to place victims in transport vehicles, a quick secondary to reassess a patient and to do blood sweeps can be accomplished at this time. If you are at a receiving facility after one of these incidents, there's a high probability that the first arriving patients will be brought by personal vehicle or police vehicle. When rescue units do arrive, there is also a high possibility that each one will be carrying multiple patients. Get in there, close the door. All right, I got a 10-year-old, not responsive. I have a pulse, I have a gunshot to the right arm. Let me see the mask, LT. You got it? I need an ID. Awesome, she's, uh, she's good to go. She's good to go. Oh, yeah. Still the line. Still the line. We got an ID established from the left DC. Never exposed. No other gunshot. No other wounds. IVs in place, 20-gauge left arm. Uh, any wrap? He's a right AC. Left AC and right AC. I'll a 10-year-old female victim of gunshot wound. He had the 10-year-old female left out of 6 as well. Another victim of a gunshot wound to the left femur, open neck, and next guy level two. We have uh, approximately six or seven more students uh, in various stages of injury. Uh, it's found uh, we're now pushing the orders right now, and this is about uh, seven five.
statistical information from Dr. Boyer, the medical director for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Broward Health North after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. Two of the gunshot wound patients expired upon arrival at the hospital, and one expired on scene and was not transported. The remaining 15 gunshot wound patients were treated at area hospitals, and as of the time of this report, all have been released. It is important to note that pre-hospital care provided to those victims made a substantial difference in their survival and outcome. A total of seven chest seals and five tourniquets were applied in the field by law enforcement and fire rescue personnel. According to Dr. Boyer, the medical director for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Broward Health North, after meticulous post ad hoc analysis of the victim transported to BHN, every patient was cared for to the higher standards in the pre-hospital setting.